Welcome back to uh, Rhetorician Day at the Rhetoric Warriors podcast. We're just going to set aside one day a week or whatever to create a full rhetorician podcast of just rhetoricians. So we're slicing up the words that you use to create your existence. Come on in and have your world taken apart on Rhetorician Day. Uh, I'm Dr. Dan French, late night comedy writer, PhD in rhetoric, founder of Rhetoric Warriors. I teach classes, sell classes, so on and so on. Talk to comedians about their careers in politics. I convert conservatives, which I'm starting to ramp up because we're getting farther into the almost coming up to the next political season. And I want to I want to have some type of effect mythically from my sitting in my chair in Austin, Texas. And I talk to persuasion pros, especially rhetoricians, more rhetoricians than any other podcast in the world, which brings us again to today. This is our fourth episode of Rhetorician Day with Dr. David Payne. David, how's it going? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Are you digging the digital life? Like, uh, is this starting to make, like you see this as your new career? Uh, well, I, 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 I haven't monetized it uh, yet, but uh, <laughs> it, it is, uh, it's always good to see you and talk with you. Absolutely. Well, you listen to those guys. You listen to some podcasts, like you listen to Pod Save America, I think. I do. I do listen to those guys. They're very smart. Yeah. what do you think about that because those guys are more traditional like parsing up politics they don't come at it from you know this kind of strong rhetorical angle but what That's do you right. get it from those kind of podcasts well you know i guess they give me what i don't have in a way uh i mean they they they're, they're not completely alien i think two of them were speech writers uh at least one of the head guys was a speech writer for obama uh but they all were in there um so i think they they and so much journalists criticism now is got a rhetorical flavor um so i don't think that they're they're out of that bailiwick at all but uh, I, I confess i haven't been listening to them as much after the election it was just they were just refreshing and uh and young and smart in, in ways that i'm not so you know. <laughs> there's a therapeutic nature to that right just listening to people Clearly. that are, seem like decent people intelligent and they're trying to make the right decisions in the world it's just nice to listen to Right. Absolutely. And, uh, and just to kind of be able to hold out an angle that uh, was a little different than the one you're used to. So, which brings it back to us, the old cynical guys. Uh, we were talking a few weeks ago about not really both of us sort of sitting here wondering where to move in America. Mm -hmm. And I All live right. in one of the places you'd like to move Austin, Texas because you lived here a long time ago. And I think Austin, you know, has a destination quality for a lot of people. It's done a great job of marketing itself as this little small liberal utopia. I'm sure. not sure that's what it is anymore. Uh, I've been here this time for it's certainly years. not small anymore. It's small. It's not small anymore. And it, it is definitely taken on, I don't know, a blander, less defined flavor. You know, you don't get the, the kind of constancy of, of weirdness and awkwardness and idiosyncrasy. They didn't keep Austin weird despite the uh, despite the bumper stickers. Huh? I think when the t-shirts and bumper stickers started, they were dead in the water at that point because then they were like... They <laughs> when you have to promote clean. it, it's already... It's yeah. already... Uh, Once it started promoting itself, it was it was in trouble. Well, I got good history in the area. I've got family in the area. Um, always enjoyed it there. It, it, it did become, I think, uh, some years back, uh, a big retirement destination. Uh, because it just, you know, people live kind of an out, outside life there. Mm -hmm. And I, I very much noticed it when I moved away from there. Uh, you know, people didn't sit outside on their front porch in the afternoons uh, to say howdy to those walking by. And uh, I moved into a place where everybody had these huge properties, but I never saw them. They were, you know, you'd walk right. around at night and you saw the TVs flashing. <laughs> no, no, you never <laughs> saw them at all. So. Uh, people always seem a little paranoid of each other here in Florida. Well, and I remember that from Newman's class. Uh, he had the metaphor at one point of when we went from front front porch stoops to back decks. Like you can't mm -hmm. stop into somebody's, you can't say hi when somebody's on their deck. You know, right. they're right. sitting down front, you can. And that just went away. And that sort of ties into what our topic is today of this idea of community in America. You know, it becomes this like all words and all locations like this, it becomes a location of contest for rhetoric and a crazy one right now with community, with the, with the, the rise of digital communities, 
the, the hyper awareness and capable media of these sort of sub communities warring with each other. And then somewhere on the other side, at least theoretically, the individual, you know, still being strong and constructed in this country. Where, where do you end up? Like, what is community these days for, for at least for, from a rhetorical perspective, the way it's kind of bounced like, around like a volleyball, you know? Well, and, and, you know, what, 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 what things are community supposed to do and how are those things accomplished uh, uh, through uh, digital communication, uh, if they are. So, um, and, and just in thinking about it, since, you know, our chat, it's, it's, it's a multifaceted and complicated thing because community is itself kind of a, a difficult and contested thing. Uh, what we what we think, you know, it's an idealized and euphemized sort of thing, and there's a lot of history to it, in uh, especially in American culture, where when people got here, there was no community. They had to they had to manufacture it from whoever showed up, uh, and in a way, that problem has has perpetuated it uh, all along. So, uh, in trying to think about it, I I sort of got back to one of our metaphors here about. Communication as our system of cooperation and, and a lot of the ills that we seem to be suffering and, and focused on right now have to do with these breakdowns in our ability to cooperate, right? How do you deal with division? Uh, and what does that have to say about, uh, you know, community? And it seems to me that that all of those ills are, you know, they're, they're, they're not created by media. They're not, they, they are social ills that have been around and at times have flared up, but that uh, the rhetoric of community, in, in, at least in the United States especially, has always been kind of the, uh, the cure um, for, for what ails you. And so right. it, it's kind of like uh, the, 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 these social diseases didn't, aren't caused by community or lack of community, but the immune system that is supposedly provided by strong community is not able to do its job uh, and if anything is kind of uh, the way that that a community is accomplished in digital media uh, is, is perhaps uh, geared to you know be destructive well it doesn't have the the things that you used to have and you hear this a lot when they talk about social media it doesn't have what live community used to have which is things like repercussions for being uncivil Sure, and and you and you and you see that in your own interactions, right? That when you go to the store and people are there that are obvious, or a restaurant and people are there, people tend to be polite and courteous, and you know they're not hateful uh, it, that that often at least. Um, uh, and so you know where where there is face to face, but we've observed you know twenty some years online now, we've observed that you know. Uh, a little flame wars break out that you don't have to be civil to these people. There's no consequences. You don't have to. Uh, deal with them face to face, or them, you know, deal with them as people, really. So I think that there's. Uh... Well, it's that I mean that the the touch points which allow us to navigate things like community and relationships, especially stranger relationships or acquaintance relationships, they go away in the digital. You know, there is no identity. There's no immediate response. There's no limits to turn interactions. Like I sometimes describe it as if you go on social media, it's like being a boxer, but anybody from the audience can jump in and punch you in the back of the head anytime they want. There's no limits to the, there's no meta rules for the community. Brutality can break out at any time. And you like, who is this person that just took a shot at me from nowhere, you know, for no reason and with no history. And enough people think the rules are different, right? That, that, they are that, different, that, clearly. Right, right. Um, I mean, there is no established social norm for those things. There's no legal norms for those things, really. Sure. So it's this weird free for all. I find rhetoric a lot of times loses its anchor points in those environments. And you, you don't really know how to talk about rhetoric from that perspective because it that democratic tradition, you know, that we sort of learned from rhetoric that it's it's people in a group talking and fighting their way towards things that kind of fragmentation doesn't you know stand up well with that idea right 
Well, yeah, there is this traditional idealism, if we're talking about the, the you know, rhetoric in community, this traditional idealism that uh, the in rhetorical theory period of, of how well it serves democratic process and allows us as a community to make decisions and compromise and, you know, uh, that's all fine, but that idea was, was uh, if it ever was completely true, was, was fostered in a, an environment where everybody uh, that was doing the talking was rich and uh, uh, right of the yeah, same class, the same culture, right? The the the, com yeah. the commonality was all there. Yeah, uh, and so that was not at stake. Uh, the bounds the bounds of, of what rhetoric had to negotiate there was not a, not uh, completely at stake. And it's back to you know our democratic ideals. They work pretty well if we ignore or only have a certain group that's that's doing the democratic process, right? Uh, we can make compromise. Well, what happens when that race? So, you know, it, it raises sort of the reflexive question is, what is it that community is supposed to do for rhetoric, okay, to enable it to do its job uh, of, uh, of allowing voices to be heard and representation and compromise and all of those, those uh, wonderful things. Um, and is it clear that digital community can do that? So has community itself somehow been impaired in that, that sort of functional way? Uh, like I said, I kind of get back to my metaphor that, that it's, uh, it's, it's kind of the immune system to some of these social ills. And when, you, when it's impaired, uh, it's, 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 not, it's not going to be there to compromise or smooth over division, uh, at, least, at least in, uh, at least we haven't found the, you know, uh, all the ways to do that. And, and part of that is because it's it's being fed. I was trying to think about you know once again is this all the the continued the continued question every time we we assess these sorts of issues is well gee is this because of digital media itself uh, and and its prevalence or is this some you know was this always around and always a problem but only exacerbated or made worse right at this particular historical moment uh, and I, I think that. You almost have to sort of say both. Sure. Um, but I, I get back to sort of what, what's, what's changed about this. And I think about, you know, Marshall McLuhan, 1965 ish, right? Color TV is just starting to show up in people's living rooms saying the medium is, is the message, right? And for 40 years over, it's kind of, well, you know, that kind of sounds cool. Well, I'm not yeah, really that's sure. Yeah, a good <laughs> what, what be right. <laughs> um, and, and, and I think maybe we could say it, you know, that's sort of an early Harbinger. He's really saying the medium is really what a client, you know, teaches you how to look at the world. Um, and and, and the, the sort of the, uh, the other parallel medium is the massage and it makes you feel good, <laughs> uh, right? Uh, well, you know, and, and this has been true, you know, historically that gathering a crowd. I mean, if you went to a Daniel Webster speech, somebody's going to figure out, gee, that's a good place to sell pies or, or whatever. So communication is um, uh, in a way commodified. But, but I would re-say it in the digital world right now, at least the way we're, we're talking about its, its current potential uh, with Google and Facebook and these things to skew um, politics. Uh, and there's a really great documentary out that I think really looks at this called The Social Dilemma. And I was looking at that. Well, what's very clear here is that communication is itself the commodity, right? Yeah. And, 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 it, and it is no longer attached to content. It doesn't really care what gets said as long as right. you're paying attention to the screen. And, it, and so, it, you know, McLuhan could have been worried about the way television and film media were um, uh, occupying uh, and, and drawing the attention of people and training the attention of people on the media instead of their immediate surroundings or whatever, uh, to say that that's the message. Um, but, but right now, it's, it's, it's occupied more than just the public space. It's occupied interpersonal relationships. Um, all the time you spend, all the things that you do, it doesn't, they, they don't care whether you're watching YouTubes or chatting with a friend or texting or on Facebook. Uh, as long as you're paying attention to the screen, they found a way to commodify that, that time spent in media, period. Yeah, and I, I tell people from my time in, inside of media, you know, producing and 
writing the things that keep your attention that that's all it is. It's like you look at the wall and say, say you see a thousand knobs that can be turned to turn. And each one is a bright bulb, you know, of a different color. And they're just great at constantly turning the knobs. As soon as you get, you know, one tick of half boredom with the light green uh, knob over here, the little bulb, then, oh my God, look at this one over here. And your brain can't defend itself from that stuff. Can't do it. Well, you can't get, you know, it, it seems difficult to get away from it because of what, 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 it, what it says has displaced everything else, right? Uh, and so if you want friendship, if you want romance, if you want uh, news, if you want political action, whatever, uh, it, is, it is sort of occupied, you know. So, so once again, what kind of, in that media environment, what can community be and what can it look like and how can it function? Uh, and one thing is uh, a pair of these kinds of uh, uh, I, these communities that are based upon identity or participation that are out there, right? Not the material relationships of family and 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 uh, neighborhood. And most people live in both, but if you're spending all of your time in the generalized elsewhere. Uh, looking for community and agreement out there, and of course the the, the 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 technology itself is designed to keep you there. And so, um, the the algorithms that they're employing are designed to continue to keep you watching and give you what it is that you're looking for, right? Yeah. So that it will further further specialize you as a member of this kind of ersatz community rather than some other. I think of the term, you know, the Kundera novel, the unbearable lightness of being. And what's happened, I think, in a lot of these ways is that they've extracted the DNA of things like community and individualism. And they sell it in the digital space. But it's such a light version of that stuff. I see people all the time from my kids' generations who think they have relationships with people that they've met online and they've only ever talked to online and they're okay defining that as a true human relationship when it's really maybe the top 7% of the experience of having that kind of direct relationship with a real human being and that lightness of community, that lightness of individualism, that lightness of relationship is, you know, it forms up and becomes political choices and consumption choices and everything else. But it's to me like a very different way of orienting through the human experience. Well, and you've several times invoked the kind of the Baudrillard version of, of simulation here where, where if you spend all of your time or the majority of your time doing social interaction through digital communication, uh, the real thing becomes a sign of the of the simulation, not the not the reverse. It's not like we're getting a weak version this way, of, of this other more genuine, authentic thing over here. It is that the genuine, authentic thing over here is simply a gesture toward the more familiar and practiced simulation. Um, well, and boring. So that, that, that if you were to meet some of these people in real life and try to you know, sustain a relationship, well, they can't do it. I mean, yeah, it's boring. You, well, there, there's certainly no basis for it. <laughs> Like the, the boredom of reality versus the stimulation of the digital, like there's zero boredom in the digital experience. Well, because you can change the channel or. Yeah. yeah. It, yeah. I mean, you keep the neural network firing at 100% all the time. And I see this all the time. Like I've been divorced for 15 years now and I've done a lot of online dating. And right. it's a fascinating world to watch people when you meet with people. And them always talking about the experience uh, of how unhappy they are with the experience of online dating, because how unreal people are there and how it doesn't translate into the you know real world. And 80% of the people I've met have just been a coffee, some boredom with who they actually are. And then, you know, <laughs> see you later. Because that, but that interplay between, you know, are my expectations gone up way too high? Because now... Like it's like a smorgasbord menu of human beings to look through. And are you comparing people to that? Or is it that you've lost touch with what human beings really are and how to value that deep experience in, in, in the moment? 
are you both more or less in terms of anything other than your, your wonderful embodied characters uh, ha living pretty much the same consumption life, right? And, and so you have nothing new to transformative to offer each other. The, that, that, that dopamine can only be achieved by continual messaging, right? Uh, so you can't just sort of meet at the at the at the at the dance and then right do, trans change each other's life otherwise because she's going to the same grocery store as you are you, you're all watching the same stuff on TV yeah so it becomes kind of a matter of matching crap up with crap I guess um, but you see that when it when you have all that digital experience and I think when people are trying to understand right now what's happened with politics how do we get you know the one thing you hear a lot from people is we're polarized. I'm like, well, right. it just to me means to me like the two strongest <clears throat> political thematics of liberal and conservative have been amplified, maybe through the digital, through the storytelling, through the rhetoric, whatever. And people either don't know how to defend themselves from it. They've been pinged like your your emotions are so pinged all the time within that theme that you can now can't talk to that other side or, you know, that we don't really understand I've heard of a lot of people in the last, for some reason, the last month, people have been mentioning de Tocqueville to me a lot. And I'm like, yeah, he was going through small towns and looking at small town meetings and things like that, where you had to figure out a community. There was no other way. But now people wouldn't do that. They might watch it online a little bit, but they're not having to fight that out in the real space and real manufacturing a real community. And he was just passing through anyway. We don't. Yeah. We don't. <laughs> well, sure. I, I would. I would just simply say though that that there seems to be a good case to be made um, that in terms of the the overall mechanisms that are that are that are making money out of the media, um, they're, they're morally neutral about whether it's peace or war that they're creating, whether it's conflict or cooperation. They 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 really. Uh, and, and, and it's actually skewed the other way, that uh, it is more exciting and it keeps people attending to it longer, right? The profits are greater through conflict. Mm -hmm. So it's not, just a neutral, it's not just a neutral medium at this point in time. It actually profits from, I mean, how many people quit after the election watching, you know, cable news? That's fewer. So, so you know, there, there's, a, there's a real sense they're missing that. And, and, you know, as you opened up our conversation, gee, we're ready for the new political season. <sighs> you know, just, just got a breath, right? Yeah. But, but um, and, and we are complicit in that because uh, once again, that conflict, that identity, that sense of where you, where you sit with this, uh, maybe is, is, is part of the community. Um, if, nothing, if nothing else, community is a commodity in both of those domains. And, uh, at conflict, and you can sort of trace this back. The community for the progressive has always been uh, um, uh, forming community has always been a way of, of fomenting change. Whereas uh, enforcing community on the conservative side has always been a way of resisting change. Right. Uh, so we're even we're even fighting about what the nature of the ersatz community is that somehow is embedded in these. Right, it's it sort of it, it, it writ, writ small the whole thing of which side loves America the most, right? Um, yeah, that idea of when you're talking about that, I thought of this sense of we feed on conflict. You know, it's like the f fish tank; they they just little con conflict every day, and everybody just goes up and eats their conflict and goes away. And it's not like it goes away. Like politics is the way place I think that you can see it the way that the news plays it out. But all of our drama is all conflict based. So you sure. go and you start watching your shows that night. I mean, how many times can you watch the equalize? How many there's so much crime on TV that's conflict and it's resolved. Conflict and resolved. And this idea that this community, like this, our entire uh species right now is basically just feeding on conflict all the time. So it's, it's got to be baked into the politics, right? Otherwise, people won't pay attention to it at all. Um, sure, sure. Uh, it, it is. Uh, I think maybe it, it, that, that isn't what's different. 
it's that the resolutions are changing, right? Um, and I've, I've been noticing this a lot in, in you know, in, in, the, in the standard sitcom, we begin and there's a problem in the family and but you know, after three commercials, it gets solved. And so these are, these are little therapy band-aids on whatever these sets of issues are. Um, but resolution always happens, right? We always, we always reemerge as, as rejoined and, and stronger because we survived the conflict. I'm not sure that that's really what our stories are doing. Uh, because uh, I guess because of COVID, uh, the, the, the content, the, the consumption of content has been pretty high around my house. I'm just noticing all these movies which spend the entire hour and a half or so setting up the conflict. And then the last scene, everybody's transformed, but I have no clue why, right? There's, there's no recommendation there as to what you might do differently or lesson that's learned or uh, it's just sort of, okay, well, it, that's over. <laughs> Well, it's that clean conflict resolution in American storytelling, right? Somebody gets magic, killed. magic, yes, whatever. You know, somebody gets murdered. You murder the right person, and then everything's fine. It's like when George Bush came on the scene after 9/11 and said, "People, we will find who did this, and they will pay." I'm like, "What's that done? What's that going to do? Is it going to rebuild the buildings? We were going to murder people better than we've been murdered, and that is somehow the resolution. That's the telos that we're after." Right. That's that's the easy that's the easy answer and the and the most easily distributed one. Let's just let's just hate somebody, right? Uh, and act on it, way. right? That's the satisfying thing about American drama is that the the villain is not only killed in like some soft way, but they're impaled, they're beheaded, they're destroyed, they're blown up. That kind of sense of ah, oh, yeah, you know, I I got something there, and then it's on to the next one. Well, that is that is the formula, right? So something has to be sacrificed to set things right, but it's always an imperfect uh, moment here, right? Uh, it's never it's never a total uh, resolution. It's uh, just awaiting the next uh, episode. So, do you think people are living that right now on the left, like waiting for the indictments against Trump and any of his people, and the sort of satisfaction they're getting from watching some of the congressional insurgents get picked out by the FBI. Do you think we're all living that kind of this sort of abeyance of that anxiety and anger for a while because we're seeing it, we're seeing some resolution? I think like with most things, we probably are on a spectrum. I think some people just want to be able to go back to not thinking about it. Some people are still heavily invested in Making it right, um, right justice, uh, and then of course there are those uh, uh, those those media outlets that are invested in keeping that 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 frenzy up. Uh, so uh, that that's still you know the story is not dead yet. So uh, I, I, it's it's hard it's hard to say exactly, but but what you're talking about is very real. Um, that, that just letting it go. And, and of course, uh, once again, in, in any conflict, I think the thing that, is, especially as a communication scholar, you step back and sort of say, well, how are we cooperating and keeping this conflict alive? Both, both sides feed off of it almost always, right? And so who, who has investment in sustaining that? And, and the truth is both sides. So uh, I guess the, the, you know, the Trump story of, the day is he's starting his own Twitter, right? um, and uh, how how will this you know? So once again, we're we're going to fuel and do some sort of separatist community thing that way. How is this going to uh, both be monetized and profitable, uh, as well as politically uh, uh, divisive? Uh, how will they go about reporting and participating in that in terms of mainstream media? or what passes for mainstream media these days. So it becomes really a conflict of locations, right? Like a, uh, that's the whole thing. Like this week, the 18 or 19 senators, Republican white guy senators went down to the border and got on a boat and wore some, some uh, camo to try to move the location of the conflict back to the border. Like they've, all, they've been doing this for the last month of, we need a new location for our fear and hate and the, the, failure of the left 
and they keep looking around for it. Like they looked around at it, tried to get it onto Hunter Biden, couldn't get it there during the election. And now they're moving it back to the border. And, you know, it's just, it's almost like they've got to find like Trump, like uh, Biden wants to, and the liberals want to keep it on like January 6th. They want to keep it on the sins of the right. And so they're, they're just, it's just a struggle of location. It feels like. Well, I, I think I think they see immigration as as kind of their 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 one of one of their two hot topics that they that they can win with. Um, uh, certainly, you go with what worked in the past, uh, and uh, well, immigration they, they, still has amorphousness to the hate, right? There's not a there's not an identified race or ethnicity with it. It's still an amorphous illegal immigrant is a generic term that you can hate on. Unless you rhetorically put an ethnicity in a... Yeah. Right. And, and that's and what I would, I mean, that's what on I would say is like... The well, more the bad hombre is that. coming from Mexico. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. The more faces like families, all that kind of stuff. And you've seen some of that from the left, but that's one of the things that they should probably do to, to uh, compete on that location, to make it more human. Well, it seems to me that that, that has been the effort of, uh, I'm done, you know, what's Biden's, I'm not going to turn down children and send them back on the other side of the border to star. We're going to have to figure out something different here. And uh, so, so you know, <laughs> there is a struggle there to how do we ramp up the hatred against this, these unaccompanied minors for Honduras or whatever. <laughs> the kids, the kids are going to take your jobs. <laughs> We're gonna, they're going to take over your daycares. That's so right. That's right. talk about your own experience of community. You've come through academics for years and years, and now you've retired and you're living in Tampa and you got kids in Atlanta, you got kids in Austin, this fragmented nature of community. What, what's your orientation towards this when you look at uh, the future? And if you're going to use this idea of, oh, you know, I'm a educated intellectual, I can therefore plot out paths for myself because I can't do it. I keep looking around like I don't know how to make the decision about what to do next for a community that I want. You know, I knew it and when I lived in LA because it was co it was comedians and comedy writers and creators. Right. And so that was my community of people. But I don't know what they are now. I don't know what I've got. Well, I think I, and I you know, I think I am sociologically sort of symptomatic of a lot of things. Uh, parents at a certain age of life when, you know, that was no less true of my parents that had kids scattered all of the United States uh, and, and achieve it at that stage of life when, uh, you know, they, uh, they, they had to seek elsewhere because the, the things that kids do draw you into contact with community interests and other things property used to. Um, and I, I think that, uh, you know, maybe that's more true some places than others still. Uh, Florida has always been a very transient kind of place. And I think people are just kind of thrown together. And, you know, I was, <clears throat> I don't know why to work this in, except I was driving home down the street the other day, and one of my neighbors is flying the American flag upside down. And I, it's just some sort of new sign of, you know, America's in distress. And I asked my, my, my Trumpian expert and he didn't know anything about this, but read it instantly the way I, that I did. And I think, you know, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the, you know, the, even the neighborhood is kind of skitzy about uh, uh, these kinds of things. Um, so, but, but then, you know, the other sources of community are occupation. So, so family and, uh, you know, uh, uh, those kinds of interdependencies and, and shared interests uh, become one. Um, uh, but, but academia has always uh, been, I think, guilty or tempting to live in a quite uh, a different community. Uh, as, and so uh, now that that, you know, retirement has, so, and I think other people at this stage of life also suffer that with cutting off from their workplace. Uh, and John Prine had the song. I think someday I'm going to go call up Rudy. We worked together at the factory uh, uh, in, in his lonely old person songs, right? Uh, uh, and I, I have that kind of feeling. You know, I, I occasionally talk with the people that I spent 25 years working with or 30 years working with, but not, not surprisingly little. 
Right. Um, so uh, I think uh, that that is also a kind of a common. And, and of course, you know, Facebook that started out to be this young person's uh, dating service wound up being reoccupied by all the grandmas in the world. Um, that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, becomes a way of managing your family photographs as well as uh, keeping, you know, reconnecting with a broader uh, group of people. And even though that may not be sustaining in terms of what you do today, uh, sort of uh, keep, keeps, you, keeps you connected in, in, in other sorts of way, which once again commodifies your community instincts and impulses. Right. Uh, well, and, 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 and your communication is the commodity. So. I've had this thought twice in my life in different locations. One when, when I was living in Louisville and I was walking through old Louisville with Bill Keith, who was teaching at the University of Louisville at the time. And I looked down the street of old brownstones because Louisville has all this old, really cool architecture. And it was, you know, beautiful little community uh, block trees and everything. I'm like, just imagine that if these 40 houses that we're looking at right now were filled with the people that you collected in your life that were your best friends, the smartest people, the most interesting people, you would never have to leave this block, you know, <laughs> but that's not, that's not what happens. Like Bill and I just happen to be in, uh, end up at the same university for a little while and him and Kari. And so we hung out a lot. And then another time when I was living in LA, LA has three Pasadenas. It has South Pasadena, East Pasadena, and Pasadena. And East Pasadena had become really run down. And South Pasadena and Pasadena were both still beautiful, but it was all the same houses in all three. But for whatever reason, financially, economically, East Pasadena had gone downhill. And I'm like, why doesn't somebody just put a bunch of money together and just buy a block and put like guards at either end? and move families in and just slowly recover that city because it's made, it's made for clearly made for middle-class or upper-class, but it would become crack neighborhoods, you know, and the sense of the buildings themselves, these beautiful buildings not being inhabited by community, but by, you know, problem uh, areas of the, of the community is that same sense of this would be a wonderful environment. If we shifted people in, if the people were there, right? Yeah. What happened to the people? Why are we all split across, even come back and starting to talk to, to you again? It's, you know, we talked, what, five times over the last 25 years? Right, right, right. I wish I, wish I knew the answer. I, what, I'm, what I think about uh, as you talk about that are the kind of the manufactured communities, like, you know, the, the, uh, the Disney celebration where we, we're going, you know, Right, we're going to build a type of people in, do they? Or, or just like well, they were all Disney employees, premise. I guess, was, was, was the main idea, but it became the super attractive thing to have this laid out planned community. Uh, the Truman Show is, you know, clearly in one of these kinds of uh, seaside uh, Florida, right? One of these manufactured environments where you have all of the physical manifestations of an updated 1890s Victorian neighborhood where everybody has the same value of house and basically the same professional as, you know, quantified by their income, I suppose, if you've got to have a certain uh, in, income to, uh, and, and then the hospital, the schools and all of that, all of that sort of taken care of by the physical building being occupied by the, by the right kinds of people. Uh, it would be interesting to go back 20 years later and, and do some work. I don't know that anybody has with, did community ever get ignited there? What, if, if, what, what's missing? Right. What's missing? And I, I think a couple of things. One's transients, right? Uh, even though you may have had this this moment with with these like minded people in a in a university community, uh, that that disappeared for whatever set of reasons, right? People moved. Uh, they encountered uh, different challenges, and uh, and I think that's probably the historical, you know, uh, is. Uh, uh, with Florida, it's, it's transient. People come down here because of the utopian, you know, yeah. possibilities. I used to call it the drain of the United States. And nothing ever gets started, and and people age, and they want to. They go. They go back to cold environments where their children are. Um, but that is such a bad sense. I think our maybe it's is it that our sense of community hasn't developed enough. It's not sophisticated enough to really look at what's important 
and what really builds communities, which is, it's not so much like-mindedness mm -hmm. as it is, like I have these parties before COVID about every six months, I would have what I would call a GOIP party, which is a ga gathering of interesting people. And it was basically everybody I'd met in the last six months, either in business or comedy or art uh, that I found interesting and that were verbal and activated people. And I would invite about 30 or 40 people to a party. And before they would show up, I would write bios for each one of them and put it online with pictures so that everybody could look and see who everybody was. So they didn't have to do the small talk or anything like that. They already had information about the whole community. They knew what they were interested in, what their occupation was and that kind of stuff. So they could find each other and then I would go around constantly forcing conversations. Like my only rule was that you had to talk constantly at this party. And it was awesome. It's like people just, they left like completely infused with the comedians would take over for a little while. And then the really smart academics would take over for a little while. And you got a sense of what it would be like to have that kind of community around. There might be some really good communication therapy, right? Or, or comic therapy of some sort. Um... A number of things go through my my head uh, that when you say what 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 is community what makes really community function and and I don't know how I haven't investigated critically how political this notion is but I think my answer would be role uh, that, that that role and responsibility and and responsibility as in terms of responsiveness to each other. So you're you're all you're 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 all responsible for being part of that, right? You have to be responsive to each other, rather than relating by some sort of technological umbilicus back to some sort of technologized center, um, where you don't relate to each other. Period, right? And and that those are the grounds for totalitarian that we're all we're all hooked as as atoms or individuals to some sort of centralized clearinghouse for whatever it is that we what are whatever our needs are rather than can you go next door to get help uh, but role also every you know what 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 I think is missing in these digital communities or fan-based communities are we we collect here because we have common interest is that you know um, there, there we have no we have no specified roles to play that are diversified from each to each kinds of things right uh, so a group of specialists who all share the same specialty may share a certain kinship of information and language, but they don't necessarily set, uh, share a com compatible set of roles. There's, there's going to be conflict for whatever the rewards are. Um, so I think, uh, and of course, no community, uh, the other problem here is the idealism that circulates it. None has ever worked perfectly or stayed immune to the slings and arrows. Of, you know, yeah, that's not human beings. Like it's not, 100% happiness. Like when you look at the Truman show and this idea that he was in this perfect environment, I'm like, where's all the conflict? Like human yeah. beings, I have this joke. Uh, I've been working on these different shows where I blend information over into pure stand up. And one of the things I was working on recently was the nature of information. And like human beings are always dealing with problems. Like that's one of the foundational things about being on this planet. You're on a predatory planet. Other things are trying to eat you. Right. The planet is not set up perfectly for you. So you're always dealing with problems. And in order to do that, you've got to be able to sort of identify them and, you know, work on it specifically like that so that you can get to a state where you're not constantly worried about your, you know, your safety and, and that kind of stuff. And when communities work together, like one of the things we have to deal with, the, one of the major problems we have to deal with is you're around other people. That's, and some of those people you like, you know, this little sphere here, you like, oh yeah, these people are great. I'd love to be around these people all the time. And then this sphere over here is people that are just problems for you. And right. it's, a, it's all the eighth grade writ large. And I mean, you know, you never get past that point of realizing <laughs> some of these people are your friends and some of these people are not. Right? But 90% of them are not your friends, right? I mean, how many, most people are a problem. At least when you get to, into the intimacy, you know, if you get real interaction with them, like we keep social distance so that we don't have to do a lot and don't see a lot of their problematics. But 
that's the other thing about digital media is that it's it's this weird collision of prep public and private and so suddenly somebody has private access to me that should be a stranger you know well back, back to our original question how does how does rhetoric serve that and and it is clear certainly with changing you know when you get outside of small regionally uh, and geographically bounded communities uh, even, even those have their problems, uh, and, and there's a history of those, those kinds of problems. But once you even get beyond that uh, and, and try to do this on larger social groups and nations, and you know, um, that, how do you that, do compromise with 500? That, 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 that creating commonality and interdependence and responsiveness to each other can easily be supplanted or can only can more easily be achieved by simply finding the common enemy, right? Sure. Yeah, all and, those and now big we know the history forces. of the 20th century. Right. <laughs> rhetorically, right? Yeah. Uh, and of course, uh, this is this is not this is also happening uh, uh, in in our own politics now. When 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 people feel like you know they 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 have lost control and uh, security and uh, things are at risk, uh, the easiest answer to to get them to act together is to find a. a you know, point your finger at a common enemy. So that's why immigration is going to continue to be a go-to uh, media topic. Uh, when, when things start to fray, find the other. Yeah, we've uh, talked about this before, I think, where a lot of the enemies uh, of the totalitarian state have been systematically, at least in America, have reached a state of victimhood and then become almost a heroic group so that you can't in this country you can't be a white supremacist you can't go after other races openly you have to do it in these kind of subterranean ways because we've dealt with some of that stuff before and we've seen that rhetoric and it's it's been dealt with enough that there's a history and a tradition of how to counteract it but like the history and tradition of counteracting Ill illegal immigra immigration is different and I've done this with some people I've talked to every once in a while. Like, like I said, I, I don't like to taunt conservatives. I don't think that's particularly enjoyable or useful, but I do like right. to convert conservatives. And if you find logical pry bars that can get, get in there a little bit, you can't do it very fast because they can't handle it. But I had a discussion once with uh, my ex's uh, grandmother, who was an Irish immigrant from the 1900s you know her, her whole family and she was bitching about the hispanic illegal immigrants and i'm like well what do you think you are <laughs> i mean the irish or the vermin right. of new york right, right she right, looked at right. me like what are you talking about and i'm like i'll just leave it right there just i got the words vermin of new york in there to <laughs> little thorn in her brain so, I mean, if you take that kind of long view of immigration, you can drag it over into that story structure, then you kind of take away some of that villainy that they're trying to do with it all the time. Right. And, and, I, and I think the conservative group is, is more um, uh, textured than that. I mean, not, 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 not everybody responds to the same dog whistles and not everybody is of, of the same mind about that. And uh, we, we can hear conscientious conservatives talking in a different way about uh, these problems. Uh, and so that's kind of, that's kind of one of the watershed, you know, it's just, it's just this cluster of populism and easy, you know. Uh, yeah. One of the great, one of the great usefulnesses of rhetoric is easy. Like if you find. And, let, and let's find a way to call, well, let's find a way to not call that community. Right. <laughs> let's find a way to, uh, but it, it's, it's the bad feeling of a good need to cop a phrase. Uh, uh, so, uh, are there are there other better ways to 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 fill these needs? Uh, you know, uh, and I I wish I could speak to it more eloquently, but a place to look, I think, uh, the last time I heard uh, uh, a number of vectors in my thinking pointed in this direction. But uh, I heard the critic Dave Hickey talk, uh, and his the last project that uh, at least I heard him do publicly was about toward a new cosmopolitanism and the idea of cosmopolitanism uh, to somehow bridge this local global split. And it seems to me that, that people are not well integrated uh, right now where they're, right now the impulses are to think in terms of 
larger social structures and relationships and the digital uh, uh, mechanisms as we've talked about them skew us in that direction, right? That's where the money is. Right. Uh, that, uh, you know, all the way from the most simple and obvious answers of buying from Amazon rather than the Ace Hardware on the corner where some guy that actually lives here is trying to make a living. Uh, and I can get it tomorrow, right, without leaving my house. Uh, whereas if I go there, the chances are I won't find what I'm looking for anyway, whatever. But, but even in those kinds of simple uh, sorts of ways that we are taught to ignore the local, and I think that's part of the national political drama that's going on. Um, so there could be a, a, you know, cosmopolitanism, there could be a way of being a citizen of the world uh, in, in one's consciousness that doesn't detract from, all right, uh, how, does, how, does this, how does this interface with, how does this exchange with my local commitments and local relationships? And somehow, you know, I think that the, the lesson here is going to be that we're going to constantly be fighting those tensions and imbalances um, and maybe attending to that in, in and of itself um, as a way of locating the problems. Um, well, I remember the times in my life when, I mean, I grew up in Kentucky, in Louisville, Kentucky, and not particularly an intellectual environment. I played a lot of sports and those those teams felt like communities and fun. But other than that, I did I felt alienated my entire childhood growing up. And even in college, again, lots of fun people. But it wasn't until I got to grad school. And I think like when you're talking about cosmopolitanness, that was my first experience. I met guys from the East Coast and things like that as an undergrad playing rugby, but I'd never met people from Israel and Lebanon and everything else. And I remember the very first party, and you were at it, uh, at UT Austin when they did a grad school party for the new grad students. And just at one point in that evening, just looking around and seeing like 100 people there, I think it was at Knapp's house, and realizing everybody in here can understand everything I say. And I'd <laughs> never had that experience ever, you know, not from being in Kentucky, not from being an undergrad where you're constantly having to lower the intellectual level, lower the vocabulary, you know, not say certain things because they weren't going to, they were too far for people to be able to have a conversation about. Sure. I'm like, no, everybody in here can, can at least equal me and probably beat me on almost everything I know. And it was just this amazing community. Moment. But you were the only one in the room that could actually fix a doorknob if it were loose, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's all pockets of expertise, right? We all have pockets of complete exactly. ignorance mostly and then and, and it's then knowing that about you and finding once again those role uh diversities uh that, that makes it less than an organic community a, a good party but yeah. yeah but it was that sense of and you know a lot of, a lot of times i look at identity politics right now and i was looking even at the podcast and out of the first 46 interviews i've done 40 have been i think white guys and i'm like oh i know a lot of white guys apparently or a lot of white guys are saying yes to me but then when I started breaking down the actual diversity components, I'm like, I have a lot of diversity for regional diversity and age diversity and politics diversity and, and these kind of things. And it's just what element are you going to look at your community based around? And there's so many, there's so many points on the community grid, which one is important and which one would actually create that community. And for me, it's always been that kind of intellectualism. Like if people are open to discussion and intellectualism, I can talk to anybody. Well, and I, I hope that's a, that's a growth in the way that we talk about diversity as well, that, um, that uh, we, we, we and, and some people that are, that, that I worked with, uh, are trying to you know, increase the way we talk about diversity, They're appreciating lots of differences that are not just skewed on race and gender and class uh, and those things, you know, the problems there being so huge, they, they've taken up so much of the, the oxygen and, and in our, our attempts to clumsily engineer society in that image uh, are going to eclipse appreciation. So part of that is just a language problem yeah. uh, of, of, not, of not really looking at the, the way that diversification works. And I think that that's, a, that's not growth of what we're talking about. Uh, understanding you know, the diversification in our roles and learning to appreciate it in a, in a more broad way. Uh, and, and once again, that requires uh, the ability to do uh, multi, you know, pluralistic points of view. 
And that requires, right, putting the conflict on the back burner long enough. Right. I'm not feeling this constant grip for certainty and, and finality and conclusion. Uh, and, and once again, and I think about that with your, your talk with uh, uh, Christine uh, Geisinger. Uh, uh, when people are afraid, uh, that's what they do. And once again, one of the one of the chief rhetorical resources right now is to make people afraid. It's easy. It's cheap, and it works. Right. right. Yeah. It's it's the infomercial for fear is is huge. Yeah. You deal you deal with your fears of danger before anything else. Like if you walk into an environment, that's the first thing you attend to. What's dangerous to me? Nothing. Okay. And then you go through your other your other levels. And so you would expect rhetoric, especially in this kind of easily, easy distribution, high production manufacture age to hit that over and over again, because it's the strongest, you know, gong to hit. Well, and, and advertising, you know, which, which I think is the other back to the, the sort of the, my thesis here about communication itself is the commodity. Historically, that, that, that blossoms with advertising, right? The advertising money and that in, that that it infects our media through radio, TV, internet. I mean, uh, it is all about advertising. That really is the mech, the, the the monetary engine of digital communication. Um, and they're they're paying to deliver your attention uh, without caring how that is done. Now, when we get to sort of, you know, why, why are the political systems using those technologies? Uh, because they always have, but um, sure. uh, there, 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 is another, there is another commodification going on there of some sort, but it is so, based on the, it's based on the advertising model. So let's go back to the main uh, point. Where are you going to move? <laughs> Where am I going to move? Where do, well, when I, you look I, out, I, what do you I, think? There's a like, number of tensions there. There's a number there's, of tensions. There's the Santa Fe's, like the kind of mystical desert locations. And I've got friends who've made that move. There's the big city, like the cosmopolitan New York and Chicago and that kind of move. There's the quiet. I've got a friend who is, you know, told me he's going to go and buy the cheapest land he can in Kentucky and just raise his kids there in some backwater there's these options, but almost everybody I know that's my age and has some freedom now from kids and things like that, they don't know how to make this decision because you're not moving towards community. You're, what are you moving towards? Right. Well, I hope to, I, you know, one of the conclusions in shopping around for what are the, 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 the possibilities are is I hope shopping for community is part of that, although that may be very difficult. Uh, I would, I would like to find greater, uh, immersion in a community and in, in, in other people, greater contact with it rather than less. What would at that be for, for you? At least for the next phase of, of this. You're not going to do academics again. So what would that right. be? What would you work that around? Well, I mean, you know, I know you... I, I, attending the city council meeting, may, you know, who knows, uh, possibly uh, local politics, at least being locally uh, connected in some fashion. Uh, could be could be playing bridge. Hell, I don't know. But, uh, you know, I had a... Well, uh, I, I gained most of my bridge skills online, which is ironic enough. <laughs> oh, really? You're a bridge player. That's that's funny. used to be. Used to be. Um, well, I will share. I will share this part of it with you because my tensions, like I say, are pretty pretty predictable with uh, uh, family and, and other kinds of and, and tensions and regional and, and whatnot. But for a, a period of time, I've been investigating the Northwest as a, as a, a, a friendly place. I've always liked it up there. I've made several trips up there in the summer. I was really displaced from it this last summer because of the whole COVID thing. Uh, and what's intriguing to me is uh, the, the, the reactions I get from people when I say Seattle uh, or Portland, uh, and I'm really just talking about the general area, but uh, the, the kinds of uh, reactions that I'm getting from everybody of the weather. Okay. Right. The weather. Okay, you're not gonna be able to stand the weather. The hippies have taken over. They've defunded the police. Homeless people are assaulting citizens. Uh, and, and so far, Elizabeth and I have kind of said, well, and, and we're going to join them, you know, <laughs> just as a way to dismiss this. this Because <laughs> that, that, that's sort of the reaction around here is, all, the, all of those communists up there, well, yes, and we'll be happy to talk with them. Yeah. <laughs> Ah, that's funny. So that, that whole conversation, uh, just as one component of this, uh, has really been uh, fascinating. 
So, uh, you're looking for some type of political, some type of political simpatico you would like to have. Uh, well, it doesn't. It, yeah, I, it doesn't have to be that commonality. I mean, uh, I, I would like to be connected. I think. Uh, and once again, I think uh, I'm not going to be able to talk to my neighbor that I think that's flying the flag upside down. I think probably that's not happening. Uh, and most everybody else uh, just tend to avoid, you know, things like that, uh, except in very small. It's, it's kind of like the CDC rules. You can now gather with consulting <laughs> adults that have also been vaccinated. Yeah, we need a political. I, I can now have a political conversation with a few ex-university people who have been vetted thoroughly. That's funny. Uh, so who knows? Uh, maybe this is it. Maybe maybe chatting with you will be. Uh, uh, an avenue to some Zoom is an interesting avenue into conversation because this is the closest thing that I've seen online to actual conversation, much sure. more so than tweeting and you know social media. I, yeah, I know, I'm not sure we're providing enough people with the dopamine per second hits they need uh, to uh, bite. I'm not really interested right, right now with this and playing the dopamine game. I've played that like stand up comedy is a gut laugh every seven seconds there is no denser form of communication than stand-up and i know the pressure of that and i enjoy it i like that diamond you know pressure what it does and you know it adds a ton of stimulation people leave comedy clubs first of all they're drinking but they leave exhausted you know they can't be stimulated more their faces hurt and everything else with this i'm like no nah, we'll make this more like a novel like just take your time like the people who want this, great. If they don't, that's fine. But I find conversation, enlivened conversation, intellectual conversation, I find it interesting. So, well, uh, you're probably like me that you have these thoughts, and it is nice to talk about them. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I just jam them into my computer all day long, and then someday, you know, I'll die, and then I'll just they'll be in the computer, just going, "What happened to him? Where would he go? Uh, Got to get this stuff out somehow." It, it is a, but the pragmatics of living in America, and this has bothered me. I'm like, well, my daughter right now is in France, you know, getting that experience. And lately she's been able to get out a little bit more from COVID. And she's like, everybody sits next to the river and drinks and listens to music. Like there's these big groups of kids and stuff. And like, they're all outside doing things. And she's like, just amazed because that's so unusual for what would be around here I mean, you go down to who Lake brought Austin the cheese and, yeah, I mean, get yeah some of that tell, tell her like to that. enjoy yeah yeah and so you know maybe is it going outside of america to find some type of simpatico culture that likes discussion and intellectualism and joy and kind of you know that like you said the sort of liberal non-capitalist orientation to the world what, where you have to go where is it in america i don't see it I think maybe, you know, at least from my generational point of view, we, we thought that's the way the world was going to be. Uh, there was this kind of communalism and, and uh, uh, ability to get along with, with uh, a broad swipe of people and not have things put at issue. And, uh, and I suppose, you know, the, the, the kind of the, the conservatives of the time saying, well, you wait, life will take, you know. <laughs> we'll teach you the lessons, and, and maybe it did. Maybe it did. Do you think um, it's capitalism that swooped that away, or is it conservatism, just that kind of general feeling of not change? I mean, those two forces fighting those all the time as uh, innovation culture or progressive culture, it we, we lose all the time back and forth to those two forces. Yeah. Well, my academic cautions is to, to not grab too quickly to one answer and sort of say that's the problem. and, and um, uh, but to say, gee, that, that is such an important question to continue to ask. <laughs> That's such an academic <laughs> response. <laughs> uh, but, but I wanted to caution that because of my, my immediate answer, or at least my answer du jour is, uh, I think it gets back to, uh, you, you'd ask if it's capitalism or what, the, the advertising culture of filling good needs with bad, easy solutions. Um, and I guess Sue Jahali, uh, the, the, the scholar, uh, got a lovely archaic old uh, video called Advertising in the End of the World, but he makes the case so clearly and directly um, that uh, if, you, if you ask people you know, in these research things, what are the things that make you happy? They will list the things that 
you know, we're talking about family and friendship and security, you know, all the things. Uh, not a single one of those things can commodity culture provide for you. Um, so there's no way to sell you the answers to those problems. What they do instead is uh, occupy your attention and have it focused on the things that they can sell you and attach to them symbols. So AT&T is selling you a warm moment with your mother, uh, but it's really the refrigerator. Uh, you know, the, so, uh, you know, uh, ad advertising has figured out how to uh, identify those needs and symbolically appeal to them. Um, but uh, that, that, you know, that is the way this is, the, what the parallel to that is the lack of control you have over who you're among, who you're with, what you're doing for a living, where you go to, to earn a living, all of the things that you know, turn us into a transient and uh, media-oriented society. Those things are there and easily available, uh, uh, whereas the other stuff's pretty hard and, and everything militates against it. So as long as I got my paycheck and I can buy a certain amount of stuff, I can live this right simulated uh, life right. And, and, then be, and, then, and then go, wow, none of that shit made me happy. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew well, they were selling me happiness? Who, I, I bought, who'd have thunk it? Who'd have I thunk bought it? happiness and they didn't <laughs> deliver it. But I, but I think that that simple, elegant case is that uh, if you ask people what makes them happy, they're pretty reasonable. In, in their answers and not a single one of them can buying some new stuff uh, provide for you. Uh, but, but the people who control the media that we are attending to are selling that stuff. And, well, and I know I'd, I'd like a more complex intellectual answer, but I don't think it maybe it has to be much. No, I think, I think the foundational answers like that are very useful. Like I talk about this a lot of times about communities, cultures, societies only have so much room in their discourse streams and if you pollute it with capitalism you know capitalist messaging with like advertising and with po political messaging what's the, there's and then entertainment what's left people mm -hmm. don't have any time left for like this discussion about community like austin yeah. is one of these locations that you find in america that grew up idiosyncratically it had some cultural infusions made it an interesting little place and then people started to notice it. They started doing festivals here. They started marketing Austin through Austin City Limits. Poor, it never intended this, but I think Austin City Limits destroyed Austin because it advertised it to the world. And through these very, you know, profitable entertainment modes of Willie Nelson and, and all these guys and sold this vision of it. And then everybody flocks here and it's gone. And that to me is this sense of you take this cultural capital, this cultural resource of Austin, Texas. And like you said, you put it into the discourse stream as a commodity and it just disappears. It just gets destroyed by attention. I, I think that's, that's probably true. Um, uh, Austin is a, you know, the years I was living there, the thing I noticed about it so much um, was that there was kind of this, community conspiracy to, 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 to do nothing but say good things about it. To always be high on being in Austin. Yeah. Uh, and, and once again, that, I mean, that's a literal hype, but I, I've never seen it manifested in a community wide thing. That I get to be cool just because I'm here and I right. arrived, right? Huh. Um, but then once again, over, over time, all of that got, that, that got come on. It felt different. There were often very alienating things about it. Uh, but, um, uh, but everybody, everybody got a little share of it as, as sort of community citizenship, right? There's sort of, right. Uh, you, you, you could always feel positive about where you lived and, and sell that to others. Uh, but, uh, you're right. Every, every one little manifestation of that sort of organic community, uh, response, the creativity really is what it is. Uh, eventually. So I, I, the first time you go to watch the bats on on Congress Street, how cool! A whole bunch, you know, here's 200 people getting together in the evening to watch the bats. Then all of a sudden, there's a sign. And then there's a, a boat, the bat tour. <laughs> yeah. Then all of a sudden, you see it on TV, Austin and the bats, and then you know the, the crowds grow, the the t-shirt sales uh, explode. And... 
Yeah. And now what's his name? That provocateur uh, right wing radio guy. I can't remember his name right now, but he drives up and down Congress Avenue when people gather doing right wing uh, intercom shit. Just screaming right wing stuff at everybody. Yeah. So well, we we didn't solve it, but uh, I think we did. I think we're going to pick some place. Let's pick like uh, somewhere in the northwest, some little town, and we'll just start talking about it as a like this super intellectual place, and see how many intellectuals and conversationalists and communication and rhetoricians we can move there. So red, we'll do rhetoric. Uh, mm town in seattle somewhere outside of seattle how about the institute for cosmopolitanism and uh, we'll hide Maybe. the rhetoric from it. i'm i'm selling rhetoric these days i don't want okay. cosmopolitan getting into my like uh <laughs> nobody knows how to defend themselves against rhetoric sales like what what is it <laughs> i'm like I, I can go there i can go there i've, I've, I've got a lot of uh Old stock in rhetoric, sure. You do, yeah. You're one of the founding uh, investors in the Burkean rhetoric. Uh, uh, even startup. even beyond even beyond that, in terms of uh, my generational place with the Iowa school, uh, was, uh, uh, the guys I had all sort of taught their last class and died. <laughs> <laughs> That's the old Cornell school before that. They hadn't really heard of Burke. Uh, I, I was kind of the one that brought the news. Okay. So. Uh, I like it. So I think maybe that maybe we can put capitalism and uh, commodification to good use. Like we'll take rhetoric and we'll actually make it a brand, a thing. I think we'll, I think you've already done that. I, I like your little rhetoric warrior icon. I think you you you've, you've been onto this already. You know, it's just a collision of so many things. Like I end up doing a marketing agency, and you realize like people kept hiring me to turn their company or whatever into something that people pay attention to in the world, and I'm like what you really should pay attention to is rhetoric. And finally, like the pandemic hit and I'm like, I had no work for doing this for other people. I'm like, well, I should do it for something. Oh, I'll just do it for rhetoric since I like rhetoric. My other thing is to do it for comedy. Like I have a whole thing about turn, turn all of life into comedy, which is the Burkean thing about, you know, it's the best frame, everything like politics, business, everything has to have a comedian, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think well, I think you're onto something because I think the the corollary we didn't quite get to with this whole digital world being nothing about uh, except about commodification of of the attention span and the behavior of the individual. And this documentary, the social dilemma, gets at this pretty clearly. Is that it's all about persuasion, and that's what that's what these guys engine engineering and doing design in Google and Facebook. It's it's all about manipulation. Yeah. Uh, that, that is, that is all it is about. Which is what it, which is what, you know, when you and, and so rhetoric teaches at least a, a homegrown defensiveness as well as, uh, well, and that's, part of it, right? about can, that. that's why I say, like, I try to teach ethical only, uh, persuasion because there are all these new techniques that have come up with production possibility and distribution possibility and the intimacy of a screen that nobody knows how to defend against. And you're not being trained at all to defend yourself against it. And the only ones that can probably come up with defenses would be rhetoricians. You know, so. Well, yeah, you, know. you have to have that, that worldview. I mean, once again, it seems to me what's different about this isn't those, that set of, of impulses or, or motives. Uh, but the, the, this is people, you know, what are people trying to accomplish? They're trying to accomplish community. They're trying to accomplish intimacy. They're trying to accomplish, uh, you know, the teenagers trying to learn the night moves. <laughs> <laughs> the, you know, everybody's trying to do social life this way. Yeah. Uh, and, and once again, uh, the, the, the medium doesn't give a damn. That, fine. That only right. keeps you here longer. Especially if I can dangle little little uh, symbols of that along the way, uh, sprinkle your world with little little uh, simulations of that uh, success. So, uh, well, I think ultimately the dystopian utopian binary that I kind of start everybody with, hey, this can be turned towards good uses just as it can be turned towards bad uses. We just haven't really explored it yet. That's why I like something like this, like the Zoom interview, you know, the idea that it's a podcast, that some people may watch it, that it has some, you know, publicness to it. Mm -hmm. So the conversation has a little more texture and a little more gravitas to it is it's pretty cool. It's not just me you having a conversation for an hour. Like sure. we could have done that any time over the last 25 years. 
<laughs> That's true. We just never did. And, and there is also the dark side that if you and I actually wound up saying something really smart, it would be available for somebody else's exploitation. Yeah. Well, there you go. You know, that's, that's just the, the way ultimate, it is. Right? The ultimate genius of capitalism, right, is it uh, absorbs everything, even its <laughs> even its enemies, and you know, it's like oh, well, it's like we're you. talking about with Austin Cool, right? It is possible to to uh, uh, to turn that into a technology for identifying and and uh, uh, commodifying uh, whatever the latest cool latest creativity is. Yeah, for sure. All right, man. Well, well it's fun. Good day. Thinking oh. of another. Think of another cool topic. Yeah, you too. Just hit me with anything. There's always there's always ways to weave this stuff back together, right? Uh, and we will uh, we'll see everybody at. We got to come up with a name for the town, like a cool rhetoric name for the town in in Washington that we're going to start around rhetoric, Rhetoricville for now. Uh, come All come right. join us in Rhetoricville. We'll be moving there sometime in the next. <laughs> decade there's your first novel rhetoricville rhetoricville cool all right this has been rhetoric warriors podcast get out there persuade some people they always need it